Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Andy Hodges, of course, coming to you live from ZTN Studios here in Harare, Zimbabwe. Our discussion this afternoon, the role of the informal economy in Zimbabwe and youth employment. This broadcast is brought to you by Zim Papers TV network, ZTN, the Zimbabwe Chamber of Informal Economy Associations, the CHIA, supported by USAID. If you have any comments or views on our show this afternoon, please feel free to send them via our Facebook page and Zim Papers TV network or via our Twitter handle at ZTN News. Over the course of the last decade, especially during the First Republic, many processing companies and big corporations collapsed in Zimbabwe, primarily due to Zimbabwe's economic situation. I am glad to say, however, that some are returning, but their absence and the need for citizens to find an alternative source of income and to make a living to support their families has seen the growth of the informal economy in Zimbabwe. Questions, however, remain. How big is this economy? What role does it play in the economic well-being of Zimbabwe? Is there evidence of opportunities for youth employment in the informal economy, including those with disabilities? What are the barriers and opportunities for entry into the formal economy? And how can Zimbabwe develop strategically tailor-made and evidence-based recommendations for various policy actors for the formalization of the informal economy? So our discussion today, the role of informal economy in Zimbabwe and youth employment. To discuss this, we are joined in the studio by Irene Maklanga, lead researcher at DEF Zimbabwe Trust, DZT, and Samuel Mangoma Wadzai, director, Vendors Initiative for Socioeconomic Transformation, or VISET. Joining us virtually this afternoon are Dennis Malua, his first Secretary General for Zimbabwe Chamber of Informal Asso Economy Associations, or ZITIA, and Kwanele Moyo from the Bulawayo Vendors and Traders Association. I welcome you to the show. Now then, Irene, um, we will come to Dennis to give us a bit of background, but Irene, let me start with you. Uh, you represent Deaf Zimbabwe, of course, as I said, and, and were, I understand, the lead researcher on the project and consolidated all the data collected. So please tell us, what exactly were the results and conclusions gathered from the study? Are there any issues that you would like to highlight? Thank you, Andy. Uh, this research was quite interesting. Uh, as you mentioned earlier on that, uh, the informal economy, it constitutes uh, a, a, a significant amount uh, of uh, percentage that is um, almost 90% to our economy. So it was really significant to find out that this economy is quite diverse and, uh, and complex. From our research, we found out that uh, youth constitutes the significant ac amount of about 60% of youth are in the informal economy. And of the 60% are also youth with disabilities. So we would find out that, uh, as you can attest in Harare, in every corner, you can meet a youth with disability, selling sweets, uh, selling uh, airtime. So persons with disabilities, they are also uh, participating ac actively in this economy. And women were also found to be mostly dominating the, the sector with uh, a percentage of 30% uh, in this economy. And uh, from our findings, we also found that uh, in the, inform the informal economy, it lacks the policies that regulate it you would find out that uh, people are working over hours. They are, they are poor working condition. You would find out that people are working in a place where there's no shed. There are no ablution facilities. So the working condition in the informal economy is quite hectic. And you would also find out that um, there is lack of value chains. The value chains in the uh, informal economy is very low. There is a high productive uh, that is happening in the farming sector. But you'd, if you go to Mbarem Sika, where you find uh, a lot of uh, 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 products that are being uh, thrown away because there's lack of value chain. So there's also lack of value chain in the informal economy. But uh, the other side of the story is that people who are in the informal economy are also making a living. They are also making life out of this informal economy. You would also find out that people are able to send uh, out p uh, their, their kids to school through the informal economy. Uh, one good example that I can, that I can, that I can give is that of um, a, young, uh, a young person that we met who was selling um, uh, this milli mill. After, out, out of that, he would he also actually attest that he's making a profit of $30 in a day. If you calculate that in a month, it's about $900, US mm. which is not taxed. Not, so a bad, lot is happening in the informal economy mm -hmm. and people mm -hmm. can make a livelihood out so, of that. I mean, did you encounter any challenges during your data collection? I mean, how receptive do you believe were the vendors to your questions? And how many exactly did you manage to interview? You know, obviously we'd like to know the sample size. Okay, thank you very much. 
Uh, you know, whenever you're carrying out research, there is uh, the data collection, and this research was, be, was mostly qualitative, where we have to interact with people. So some people rece were receptive and some were not. But I uh, would like to say that people were very, rece were very receptive to give us the question, to answer the questions that we were asking uh, during, the, during the interviews. Samuel, let me come to you. As I said, I will be passing across to, to Bulawayo, Kwanele Moyo, and of course, Dennis Malua, the first secretary of the chair. But before I do that, Samuel, the organization Vendors Initiative for Socio-Economic Transformation, or VISET, was formed and registered as a trust in 2015 to spearhead the social and economic transformation of street vendors by championing their quest to earn livelihoods in the current harsh economic circumstances. This is, of course, according to your own website. The association has a national membership dollar base of around 68,000 vendors in all major cities, towns, and growth points in Zimbabwe. So, your view, how important was the need to carry out such a study and what are your views on the results obtained in the study, as articulated slightly by Irene? A massive, uh, uh, and um, I, think, I think we are now in agreement as a country that uh, uh, we are where we are um, uh, because of the efforts of uh, our young people uh, who are being churned out from universities and colleges, their efforts to join the informal economy and uh, survive through means that are not uh, criminal. Uh, so the, the importance of this research can never be emphasized mm. and we, we need the figures, we need the, the statistics for us to be able to inform policymakers, for us to be able to engage uh, the government and all the uh, agencies uh, that uh, can uh, support the development of the sector from an informed point of view. Mm. That's why we were uh, very prepared as an organization to participate uh, in this research because we knew that uh, it was going to assist uh, the growth and development of the of the sector. That's why we we contributed even in terms of uh, ensuring that some of the interviews uh, really happen and uh, you know to communicate with our members throughout the country that uh, look guys, this is our project. We need to participate because the information, the recommendations uh, uh, that are going to come out of this research are going to assist mm. us to grow and really contribute to the development of our country. So you support Irene in that the the, the various members or vendors or, or people working in the informal economy they were open and they they. Did, they did answer the questions in terms of what you were asking? Absolutely. Of course, okay. you find one or two, you know, trying to be difficult. But I mean, uh, because of the efforts of the associations to get the information out there about the importance of this uh, mm. uh, research, uh, I mean, 90% uh, of uh, the people that were engaged were cooperative and they participated. Because as you said, it, it's, yes, it's to their benefit, isn't it, absolutely. at the end of the day? Absolutely. Um, we are now joined virtually by Dennis Malua. He is first secretary general from the Zimbabwe Chamber of Informal Economy Associations, the chair. Dennis, uh, welcome to the program. Welcome, Andy. Uh, greetings to you. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, sir. Right, Dennis, let me, let me jump straight in. Now, of course, a group of 22 informal business associations came together to form the CHIA in 2002, if I'm not mistaken. The organization works with informal economy workers and traders who engage in different economic activities across the country. There are currently 46 territories across the 10 provinces. It also has women, youth, and persons with disabilities in its structures. So, of course, you carried out a study titled Youth Employment and Informality, an Informal Economy Assessment of Zimbabwe. So, Dennis, please tell us more about the project. For example, has the research project been completed? Why did your organization feel you needed to carry it out? And what did it aim to achieve? OK, uh, thank you very much, Andy. OK, fine. Uh, like like uh, we've said that um, our, our organization is a wide press ac across uh, the 10 provinces with over 46 territories in Zimbabwe. These structures involve young people, uh, both living with disabilities and uh, uh, women. In, in, in these structures. And these young people, they are also members of the informal economy who are striving every day to, to make a living and also contributing somehow to the growth of the national economy. So this uh, survey was important for us to get an understanding, a deep understanding of how exactly uh, the young people are surviving in, in, in this uh, economy. Uh, just to, 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 to be on an informed perspective such that when we get to positions of uh, policy in, uh, decisions, then we are very much abreast with 
exactly what is on the ground, the challenges that, the real challenges that people are facing, not just the issues that are being discussed in, in, in offices here and there, trying to lobby for, for policy change, but the real challenges that the young people are facing on the ground and how they are managing to, to, to live. And uh, what we wanted to achieve through this uh, survey was that once we have an understanding of how exactly the young people are surviving. We can then approach with, with a, from an in, informed perspective, we can then approach with a realistic uh, idea how we can solve the challenges that young people are facing in the informal economy. And yes, of course, so far, the survey that we were doing, uh, we were through, we are through with it. Okay, well, we will get to the recommendations later in the show, but um, Dennis, what was unique about this study in your view? Okay, um, I think what I found very unique about this survey was the fact that uh, young people are the one who came to this, uh, this survey in, in partnership with, with our colleagues. It was us, the young people who are on the ground. We, we, we had to get in the field and we had to meet other young people and we had to get their, their, their views. So sometimes when, when a, a person from your different age group is trying to address your issues, they might not be able to understand it clearly because of the different ages. But now I, as a young person in the field, trying to understand how another fellow young person was, was living, this was very unique for us to, 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 to carry the survey. And I think uh, this is one of the most fascinating aspects of, of that survey. Dennis Malua, we will come back to you later in the program. Um, I'd now like to, uh, to be, we're joined now virtually again by Kwanele Moyo from the Bulawayo Vendors and Traders Association. Kwanele, I hope you're with us. Welcome to the show. Kwanele, can you hear me? Okay, well, we'll try and get her on because uh, it was important because she, as I said, comes from Bulawayo Vendors and Trailers Association, and they did carry out the survey um, in Matabililand. So it would be interesting to know what results came from Matabililand as compared to the national and whether there were any unique aspects of Matabililand that, were, that should be, you know, at least highlighted in the report. Okay, excellent. You're watching, of course, our discussion this afternoon, the role of the informal economy in Zimbabwe and youth employment. This broadcast is brought to you by Zimpaper's TV network, ZTN, the Zimbabwe Chamber of Informal Economy Associations, ETIA, supported by USAID. Samuel, I did ask earlier, Irene, I asked about the sample size of the study. And, and of course, why I asked that is because you know, different sample sizes give you obviously different results. And of course, having enough people being asked gives you effective results, so to speak. And of course, you have 68,000 members. So, and again, I, you know, in terms of the receptiveness, because, you know, some people can be scared to talk, some people cannot tell you the truth or gloss over the truth. Uh, uh, so sample size, were you happy with it? And, and really, you know, were the answers like straight and down to earth? Yeah, like I said um, uh, in the beginning, um, we, we, we had engaged our members. Uh, so that they fully appreciate uh, the importance of the of the research. Mm. Um, so the majority of uh, our members who participated were informed and they, they really appreciated the importance mm. of the research. What about challenges? I mean, mm. you know, you said 46, 46 areas around the, all the 10 provinces. Did you manage to get out there and, and talk yes. to everybody in every province at least? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we covered uh, over 90% uh, of the districts that we had targeted initially. Um, and I'm happy uh, and to uh, let you know that uh, we also managed to make use of uh, technology. So it was very easy for us to be sure uh, that we have reached all the corners that of the country that we wanted to, 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 to reach. Mm. Uh, we used an application that would allow us to know uh, for, sh for with certainty that uh, someone is in Goromonzi is having an interview with uh, someone in Goromonzi. So we, 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 are, we are very sure of that. So you could break it down into different provinces, different regions. Yes, and even yes, yes. Probably, I suppose, even different <coughs> products that they, were, that they were selling. Some are vendors doing fruit and veg. Some, of course, are, are maybe small vendors doing other larger objects. And so uh, absolutely. We were very uh, deliberate in terms of ensuring that we are diverse. We reach all the corners of the country and we, we target all the sectors 
as uh, the segment of the of the informal economy. So we are happy with the with the size that we covered. We 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 managed to reach to reach all the the angles. Okay, thank you, um, Irene. Your methodology. Um, again, it's important because some people can say, well, you didn't cover enough women, you didn't cover enough men, you didn't cover enough persons with disabilities. What exactly was it and what did, what, what did you use, basically? I asked, as I said, because it does have an impact on any study or project. Okay. Uh, so with regards to our methodology, we used a methodology that is called tri triangulation. This is whereby we come up with three different methods of collecting data. So what we did in the f at first, we did uh, the focus group discussions. Mm. These were carried out in all the 10 provinces of Zimbabwe, where we met with, uh, a gr uh, with 20 groups of 15 people uh, in every province, discussing of the issues mm. on, uh, in the informal economy. And then we further went to, dis uh, to, to carry out the key informant interviews. With these key informant interviews, we then targeted those who are the, the, the people who are specialized in the informal economy, those who can influence the policies to have their perspective on what's happening on how and how the informal economy is operating. Then after that, we further went to do what is called a survey. A survey that's when we reached to about 2,444 participants in Zimbabwe. And as Elia said by Samuel that uh, we used uh, technology. We used a data collection tool that is called COBO Toolbox. This is a data collection tool that can, uh, whereby when someone is carrying out an interview with someone, we can know when the form is submitted, where the interview was carried out from, and it, can it, and it does a, uh, a quick report on in which sector was this person belonging to. So our initiative were very deliberate. Mm. We actually did, uh, we actually mapped out how we were going to carry out um, uh, this study. We actually had a map on where are we, going, where are we targeting, which groups are we going to be targeting so that we are not going to be biased so towards vendors? So scientific and auditable. Yes. And that's the key, isn't it? Yeah. Sure. Um, now, we, we have managed to get a hold of uh, Cornele Moyo virtually uh, from Bulawayo Vendors and Trailers Association. Cornele, welcome to the program. Cornele, can you hear me? Okay, we'll have, we'll have to keep trying on that. Um, uh, let me cross back to Dennis Malua, first Secretary General from Zimbabwe Chamber of Informal Economy Associations, the chair. Dennis, um, again, I've asked my guest in the studio, particularly Samuel, so, but in your case, what was your experience in interviewing informal traders? Did you encounter any challenges during the interviews or any that were reported to you by the various organizations your body represents. In your view, as I said, as I asked Samuel this, were vendors and traders open to answering your questions? Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you again. So uh, I think I, I can say that the, the, the challenge, the, the, the biggest challenge that we had was that uh, because of the, the continued the violation of workers' rights that we have seen, the people are, are not so convinced and not that you would blame them. They would be convinced that when they see an individual coming from uh, these NGOs, get a perception that uh, they might be uh, people from um, political uh, backgrounds. So the politicization part was uh, the major challenge that we faced. But otherwise, besides that, uh, when you get to the ground and you get to, to proce uh, the process of interviewing, the, the experience was quite something else that we didn't expect because we thought it was just going to be an experience of getting into the field and uh, meet people and ask them questions. Yet when you begin to find out what uh, a reality that people are facing, then uh, some of the truth was heartbreaking because you'd find that the young people in the informal economy are basically not being able to afford a, a, a normal basic lifestyle because of the time that they wake and the nature of the business that the, the, the environment of uh, the business they are, people cannot uh, actually able to, they're not able to produce enough because of the, the environment that they're trading in. And some of the, the work that young people are doing to get a living is something that cannot be uh, recognized as a, a basic a standard uh, type of work. So it was quite an experience that was, uh, it was, it was informing, but also it was very, um it was painful i could say that way because you would find that uh, let's say for example one interview i had a, a woman with uh, two children who said that 
she had to still to sell uh, paper bags in the street and uh, she, she managed to get around uh, maybe 30 or 40 dollars a month and then you will now try to understand how can this person manage to live life with such kind of an income uh, uh, on a month so you'd find that of course there are other informal economy players young people in, in the informal economy who are able to make it because of the environment they are but there are some who are in some areas uh, which are almost failing to be able to to live uh, as, as basic as they can live mm. Thanks, Dennis. I think we have managed to get uh, Kwanele Moyo from the Bulaway of Vendors and Traders Association. Kwanele, welcome to the show. I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, I... Oh, good. Good to have you here. Kwanele, you, of course, are on the, sh on the mm -hmm. program representing the Bulaway of Vendors and Traders Association. And I understand uh, your organization was also partly responsible for carrying out some of the study in Matabililand. So, uh, let me ask you a two-part question. What parts of Matibililand did you cover? Because it obviously is quite large. And also, can you comment on the outcomes? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Please go ahead. Did you hear my question? Kwanele? Okay, well, I'm, unfortunately, we seem to be having... Um, network issues there, because of course, Bulawayo is quite, quite a distance away from Harare. But um, Irene, um, maybe you could come in here, because different regions, different areas, maybe different problems, if I can call challenges, let's use that word rather. Anything specific? I know Cornelia would probably be the best person to answer this, but you can. Anything specific from the Matibila land area in particular? Okay, thank you very much. That's a very good question. Um, I think what we found out from that was uh, quite a bit different from from uh, Matabeleland and and Harare was that uh, the business sectors that we are in uh, in Matabeleland would find out that uh, they are they are more into arts than than those who are into Harare, those, than those who are in Harare, and there were more craftsmen in in, in Matabeleland. Mm. So you'd find that the the dynamics in the business sectors. Was quite uh, was quite different, and also in terms of uh, operation, they seem to be not having much problems with their um, with their councils than those who are in Harare. So those were some of the dynamics that we we managed to pick out from from our findings. Are you saying that being a vendor or employed in the informal economy rather in Matibili land? was, let me, if I can say, slightly easier, if that's the right way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, it, it, it seemed to be slightly easier in, 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 in Matabeleland than, than in Harare. And also that um, most uh, people there, they are moving, like there is high of uh, migration to the neighboring countries mm. than, than in Harare. So... Mm. Such mm. dynamics we, we, we picked. And, and I also assume with Matibili land, I suppose, I don't know if it's possible, you can have cross-border informal economy, and they're right there by Botswana, South Africa's up the road, whereas Harare, of course, is, is quite far away, you know, from Zambia, border, and Mozambique, and so on. Yes, cross-borders were also part of the, uh, uh, sort of like a, a sector that came out that we were not, that we had not uh, put on our list of um, informal in enterprises, but it also came out prominent. In, mm. in, 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 those, in, those, in those circles. And in areas like Gwanda, mining, artisanal mining was also coming out to be some mm. of the activities, some of the informal, uh, informal activities that are happening there. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if Kwanele Moyo, if you're back online, um, can, can you hear me? Okay, no, unfortunately we haven't been able to, uh, to get her back, but we will keep trying. You, of course, are watching our discussion this afternoon, the role of the informal economy in Zimbabwe and youth employment. This broadcast is brought to you by Zim Papers TV network ZTN and the Zimbabwe Chamber of Informal Economy Associations, the CHIA, supported by USAID. Um, you know, I, I, this section now, I want to get to the recommendations. We've, we've heard about the uh, methodology. We've heard about some of the results, the, looking at women, looking at youth, looking at persons with disabilities. Now let's get to the recommendations from all of this data you gathered. So, Irene, I'll start with you before I bring in my other guests. Briefly, could you, could you comment on the study's recommendations and exactly what the, these were? Okay. So uh, the beauty of this study was that uh, among us, our, our, all our data collection tools, we had a party where, the, where, where we wanted to get the recommendations from our participants. So the major recommendation that came out was access to finance. 
it's a big problem because most of uh, of these people they are into their uh, form of business that they are in because it's self-funding they do not have collateral to go into the banks so one major recommendation is if youth uh, or informal uh, economy traders could be given opportunities to go and borrow money uh, with uh, a slight um, uh, lenience on how they can repay the loans that could actually help mm -hmm. uh, our informal uh, traders. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that, that we recommend is on policy. There is nothing that is regulating this sector. So coming up with, with policy and acknowledging that this informal economy is there, there should be policies that should govern the, the, the informal economy and as well as the infrastructure. When we're okay. looking at persons with disabilities, it's very difficult for them to operate in this, uh, in this, in this sector because the structure that's there, it's not accessible to them. Even the market, the market styles, when they are being designed, there is no consultation or, uh, to persons mm -hmm. with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So our infrastructure, as well as um, the operating environment, it has, mm -hmm. to be, it has to be conducive and inclusive. And we also take uh, a look at um, uh, what we call, um, let me just... Uh, this, this is the recommendation. But I, I, yes. I'd, I'd like to touch on that access to finance very quickly. I know I will ask Samuel later about mm -hmm. formalizing the informal economy, which of course is something <laughs> which I'm sure which could take a whole program on its own. Mm -hmm. But this access to finance is an issue. You go to a bank, they want to know your, they want to see your books, they want to see your cash flows, they want to see if you have security. And of course, this sector, that really doesn't, doesn't count, does it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. They actually confirm that uh, they also lack uh, the financial literacy skills. Mm. They do not. They don't know how to do the bookkeeping. And uh, to them, because they do not know, they don't know the value of it, mm. the importance of doing the bookkeeping. Because when you go to the bank, they want to see. They want to 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 track your records. Yeah, even a microfinance loan, they'd want to see something. Wouldn't exactly. They? And which they want a bank account, which they don't have, and so on and so forth. I suppose. But Samuel, I know, is probably the better person to answer that. Yes. But before we come to you, Samuel, I, I want to get back to Dennis uh, Malua, first Secretary General from Zimbabwe Chamber of Informal uh, Economy Associations, the CHIA, who's of course joining us virtually. Uh, Dennis, um, I hope you can hear me there. Um, I want to focus on the recommendations of the study. Uh, your comment, uh, you heard Irene articulate some of them. Your comment on the recommendations, and further, is there anything in them you'd like to highlight? Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you again, Andy. So, um, when, we're looking at the, when we're looking at youth in particular, because if I'd like to focus on the informal economy, yes, that's another topic, but when looking at young people, uh, them uh, being a part of the, them being 60% of the population of the nation, I think this is uh, when we are, this means that we are over half of the population of the nation. So I think there is a very huge need for the government to sit down and look at what these young people are good at doing. Because trust me, from the findings, you would find that there are so many uh, creative young people out there who are failing to find opportunities and spaces to grow. So I think there is need for young people to be put on the table in terms of policy making. And uh, once that option is provided, then young people can decide for themselves what is better for them, how best we can create an environment for young people to thrive in the informal economy. Mm. And I think uh, there's, there, there's opportunities of growth in, in their businesses because you'd find that some of the people are, are coming with something new that is totally new, something that has not been there before. And once something, when something new is being created, then there's opportunity for growth. So youth need to be taken seriously and we need to a platform where we can address our issues on our own. Youth in the informal economy is a priority at the moment because we constitute to the greater part of the nation and therefore we are bringing the bigger part of the economy uh, I think that, that's what I would, I would right. want to recommend Den for Dennis, now. Dennis, uh, before I move on, because I believe we do have Cornelia on the line, but I, I want to move on before we lose you uh, virtually. Your organization's views, briefly, do you think these research findings will add value or transform the lives of the informal economy workers or not? And if you think it will, how do you believe so? I think certainly there's an opportunity that uh, our lives can be transformed if we are able to get the opportunity to speak these uh, issues, if we get an opportunity to, uh, to infiltrate the policy making decisions, because once we have 
this information. We are now coming from an informed perspective where we actually have a, a first-hand information of what is on the ground. Mm. So when we are able to talk these things as real as they are, then we are able to represent the majority of the nation what is really needed on the ground rather than just say, uh, maybe perhaps we might think that what we need to do is, is a, a policy change, yet what we really need is recapitalization of uh, young people's businesses. So once we have this information now, we know exactly what we need to do and how we are supposed to go about means and ways of trying to improve the lives of young informal economy workers. Thank you. Um, I believe we do have Kwanele Moyo from the Bulawayo Vendors and Traders Association on the line. Kwanele, I hope you can hear me now. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, it's good. It's good to hear you there. And I hope Matabila and is, is nice and not as cold as Arari. But Kwanele, let, let me ask you, I asked Irene to cover this, but I think it's better coming from someone who's based in Matabila land. What areas of Matabila land did you cover and what were the outcomes? And also, again, what, what differed? Because um, Irene mentioned that a lot of people in Matibila land in the informal economy went to arts and so forth. What was different if you looked at it from the perspective of the national, national results? Uh, all right. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, so as Wulawai Vendors and Trade Association, we covered uh, Wulawayo, Matibila North, uh, and Matabelin and South. So in March North, uh, respectively, we covered those following areas, Ngai, Lupane, Cholocho, Victoria Falls, and Wange. And then under March South, we covered Bait Bridge, Pilabusi, Plum Tree, Matopo, and uh, Gwanda. Uh, so uh, what was different uh, about the, 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 the findings in March North and March South is that um, and developed people are venturing into um, uh, the, the works of their hands. For example, they are into artisanal mining, especially in Mat South, in Matobo. They are into artisanal mining. And then um, in Gwanda and uh, Bait Bridge, uh, they are venturing into vending, informal trading, and um, agriculture. So I think uh, it's what was a bit unique about uh, the findings of the study in Mat. And in, you had no problem. Atalela. They answered your questions openly. They were, they were sincere about what, what they wanted and some of the issues that you asked them in the study? I, I didn't quite get that. I said they, were, they, they answered your questions openly and you had no issues with, with interviewing. People didn't chase you away, so to speak. They were open with you. They were very much open and welcoming. Uh, they were open to answering all the questions. I, I didn't face uh, any intimidation from them. And, Cornelia, did, did you agree with the national findings in the study? Did you, when, I mean, obviously, you've seen the study. Did you agree, did you agree with them? Or, or were there anything there that you felt could have been missed out from a Mati Bileland perspective? Uh, I concur with the findings. Um, for example, uh, there is little or, knowledge on the, or no knowledge on the acquisition of loans. Um, informal traders have no or little knowledge on how to acquire loans. I think there is lack of information on how they are supposed to apply for the loans. Information must be made available to them. And then there is lack of social security. There is no paid leave. There is no maternity leave. There is no medical aid. There is no pension. There is no security in the informal economy. Yeah, this is one of the things that I noticed uh, from the findings. And then um, the infrastructure available does not cater for people living with disabilities. I think... Uh Hello, Cornelia? Okay, all right. So, uh, we'll, we'll try and get her back because it, uh, she was giving us a very good rundown on Matty Bililand perspective, particularly when it comes to informal economy. Dennis, um, let me come to you and I will come back to Samuel, who's waiting patiently in the studio, but I don't want to lose you. Uh, Dennis, of course, Malua is the first Secretary General from the Zimbabwe Chamber of Informal Economies, Zichia. And uh, De Dennis, how can the informal economy, in your view, create or stimulate youth employment in Zimbabwe? That's my first question. And based on the study's findings, what advice can you give players in the informal economy, the government and development agencies? Okay, uh, thank you again, Eddie. So I think that um, the, the, the informal economy, our role is that if there is a, 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 a good process of... Uh, transition of uh, the informal economy to formal economy. This is going to be an, an advantage to our government in terms of revenue coll collection, henceforth being able to, to contribute to the national economy. So I think that once we get to deal with the issues of how the informal, the young people in the informal economy are, are thriving on the ground, and if we get to address those issues as they are, we get to find out 
the real, if we have the findings now and we need to find solutions, lasting solutions to attack those challenges, and then we can get to have a better informal economy because we know that the young people are the future economy. And as long as their, uh, as long as their future is trapped in the, in the crumpling of the economy, then certainly we have no future at all. So the recommendations I can then give to the government is that we need to begin to consider how to create environments where young people can thrive and create sustainability in our country. And into the, into the informal economy players, we need to, to, to continue to work as hard as we can, keep on building new ideas and keep on thriving as we are doing already, because right now the informal economy is the one that is driving the economy of the nation. So we need to continue to keep on giving those new ideas and try to find places where we can, we can, we can excel. And then to the agencies, helping agencies, right. uh, one of the issues I realized was a major challenge in terms of, uh, uh, in, in the research findings, it was capitalization. Uh, like Irene said uh, earlier, uh, a lot of people, maybe because of uh, COVID-19, uh, they, they are crying because of capitalization. Uh, so I think that's one thing that may be done. Maybe it might not be a good idea to deal with cash, but if there could be a position that can be taken that... Uh, young people can be visited on the grounds and then we can see the business that they can be doing so that those businesses can be improved i think that's one right. way that could help uh, uh, young people yeah. in Dennis, let me jump in so you believe that there is a there is an avenue for youth to gain employment in the informal economy as long as as you said some of your recommendations are taken on board that i believe that's what you're saying but also maybe you could very quickly because we are coming to the end of the show where can people actually view this study? Is it, is it online? How can they actually access it? Uh, the study that we just had, uh, we actually, as the chair, we have, um, we have uh, our social media platforms. I think that's when we can uh, post some of the, the findings uh, that we, 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 we found. But okay. so far, the study that we did was just uh, online. We did it online. Ah. It was not a physical. So I think most of the findings can be found online. Okay, brilliant. So go and look at Zichia and other associations, uh, Vizet and so forth, DZT, I'm sure. They'll be posting some of the uh, results on, uh, online to their platforms, Twitter and, of course, Facebook, et cetera. Um, thank you, Dennis. Um, Samuel, I know you've been waiting patiently, but I, I, wanted to, I didn't want to lose them virtually. But So let me, let me come to you, mate. Um, your comment on the findings and further in your view as per the findings, is there an opportunity for young informal traders to grow and expand? And of course, how can informal traders be assisted in enhancing their businesses and their lives? Uh, what do the findings show about the operational environment for informal traders? So I suppose it's a three-part question. Um, opportunities for young informal traders to grow and expand. How can they be assisted in enhancing their business and lives? And there's a finding show. What does it say about the operational environment? Yeah, of course, uh, this uh, study is going to assist a lot of uh, young people to get the linkages that they need. Um, I, uh, you were, you were, we were talking about uh, the comparisons that we were making about uh, the findings from Matebele land and the findings from uh, Mashona land areas and other, other parts of the country. Uh, I think uh, that diversity, that information that we may not have um, is now there. Uh, so they can tap into uh, some of the skills. And come up with some good recommendations for policy holders, for policy makers, uh, uh, developmental organizations. So absolutely. I think that's critical. Yes, that's, that's, that was the thrust, actually. Mm -hmm. we, we, we had this research solely to... to we, we are solutionists. We, we want to find solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we know there are a lot of challenges in the informal economy, mm -hmm. but we cannot sit back and say, mm -hmm. because there are challenges, we cannot do anything. So the, the objective of this research is to assist authorities to assist development partners to come in and assist um, uh, uh, the growth of the, of the informal economy. Now, we, we have only got a few minutes left, and this is quite an important question. As I said, we, we could talk about this for quite a long time, so I'll ask you to be brief. How can the informal economy migrate to the formal economy? So there is already a starting point, uh, and there is a recommendation 204 of 2015 that was put in place by the International Labour Organization, which stipulates and clearly articulates how nations should support the informal economy to transit from informality to formality. There are steps that are supposed to be followed, and I'm happy to say that uh, our country is uh, a signatory to that recommendation. They support that transition. 
And this process that we're doing is part and parcel of that process to ensure that uh, when we start those processes of formalization of the informal economy, it should be holistic, it should be inclusive. The strategy must ensure that we cover those the greatest components of the of mm -hmm. the informal economy, and that's the young people, that uh, women, uh, 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 people with a disability. Our formalization strategy must always focus on growing the informal economy. So it should I not be about yeah. taxing the informal right. economy, but should be about assisting the Letting sector grow. to grow. And the, and so the way the forward economy. then, you're taking this report, I assume, to government, to policyholders, to development organizations, and you're hopefully coming up with a clear strategy that can be implemented. Because we always say in Zimbabwe, we have great projects, great studies, but yeah. nothing happens on the ground. Yeah, already, they, I mean, uh, they say they already, they, I think at the tail end of last year, the government launched the, uh, the development of the formalization strategy, which some of the organizations were participating in, mm. but we continue to call for inclusivity. Let's expand the consultations, ensure that everyone participates. I mean, uh, DZT, as I said, lead researcher there. Any final words, just very briefly, on, on this whole study and the way forward in particular? Uh, I could say that the, the study has uh, set uh, another tone and has provided findings that can be used to come up with holistic approaches on how we can grow the informal economy. Okay. Well, on that note, I think in a very good note it was, we come to the end of our discussion this afternoon. I'd like to thank our guests. Irene Mahlanga, lead researcher at Deaf Zimbabwe Trust, DZT. Samuel Mangoma Wadzai, director, Vendors Initiative for Socio-Economic Transformation, or VIZET. Dennis Malua, first secretary general from the Zimbabwe Chamber of Informal Economy Associations, the CHIA, and Kwanele Moyo from the Bulawayo Vendors and Traders Association. Now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for appearing on the program this afternoon. Thank you. You've been watching our discussion this afternoon, the role of the informal economy in Zimbabwe and youth employment. This broadcast was brought to you by Zim Papers TV network, ZTN, the Zimbabwe Chamber of Informal Economy Associations, the CHIA, supported by USAID. A final comment. The informal economy is a vital cog in not only the structure of how Zimbabwe's economy works, but also, if it is harnessed effectively, can contribute an enormous amount of income to the fiscus, as well as play a key role in stimulating and creating youth employment. With an estimated 70% of all economic activity taking place in the informal economy in Zimbabwe, it cannot be ignored. And in fact, strategies must be put in place to harness it, bring it into the mainstream economy, and use its obvious advantages to contribute to employment creation and ultimately the economic growth of Zimbabwe. I'm Andy Hodges. Have a great afternoon. Goodbye, and please, you will be safe.